he graduated with Tyler and Austin. No, Austin, 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 Austin. Tyler and Trevor. And anyway, he's like their age. A Clint, I think Clint graduated with them. Anyway, that that crew, but and this was forever ago. Y'all were probably like, oh my. You might not even when you're in elementary school yet. Yeah. yeah, surely you were. Very good. Anyway, Leslie had one of those license plates that lit up around, or like the little thing around his license plate that lit up. Mm -hmm. And there used to be a cop that worked in Magnolia. I haven't seen them in forever, so I don't know if they still live here or not. But he was like that.
touch like his part in the panel. That's not gonna be wow. like I mean there's pictures of it and they're completely crumbled yeah. and he came out with like just a few old ones and some very good to you now, God, we do, uh, <coughs> we do thank you uh, for the, the praises, the, your providence in our lives, your protection. Uh, God, we come and, and we ask you now to, to protect uh, those who are sick, those who are in the hospital, those who are getting test results back, so many in our church that are uh, going through treatments. Uh, God, we pray for Doug Ramsey and Pray for uh, Dave Nix as so he'll have some uh, tests this uh, this weekend. And God, we pray for uh, so many others that are on our prayer list. We lift them up to you. Uh, God, we, we just ask now that, that each of these that were mentioned tonight, um, <coughs> that your hand would be uh, upon those situations, that you would comfort uh, Cam's family, the Warren family, God, that you would uh, offer some sort of a hope in, in tragedy, that even in the midst of tragedy, that there would be hope found there, hope in the gospel, uh, hope around friends and, and family in that situation. Now we uh, come to you now thinking about the next few moments as we continue through Acts and as we continue to look at your plan, as we start to see Paul on trial for being a follower of you. Let us be encouraged and found as faithful as him, that, that even though he stands before people who can take his life, he's still faithful to share the gospel. Uh, let us see your protection of him, your care uh, for your plan, your purposes in his life, and pr I pray that we use that in our lives, thinking through <coughs> your plan and your purpose for us. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
there. You know, some of you are like, who cares, gross? It's that piece of chocolate out there. Where you go, okay, I, I need to be faithful. Why do I need to be faithful? Because the kind of God that, that I'm serving is the God that's setting me free. Um, what were you going to say? Oh, yeah, I was going to say that well, we, don't, uh, we have confidence in it because we know that we don't have to worry about it. We don't have to, don't have to defeat your evil self because God's going to do it. Yeah. I don't have to beat up evil, does it? Yeah. Now I'm supposed to kill that guy every day. I am. I'm supposed to fight with him and battle with him, but I know this. Here's my confidence. I know that one day, somebody's going to come help me kill evil dust. God's going to come in. He's going to banish that guy from my life. He's going to destroy him. So ultimate victory, already mine. Which should give me confidence day in and day out, right? This guy's not as strong as my God, as the spirit that I'm connected to. What you got? Uh, just thinking about like, yeah, we're, it's, it's gonna, we're gonna die one day. Mm -hmm. So, like, while we're on this earth, we're supposed to live for Christ. So, we're back to evil spirits being involved and uh, yeah. dying is gain as quick as it is. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's a promise. That's a promise that it's a good thing. Heaven's good. Being with God for eternity is good. There's a promise we have. Hey, for all the believers, you get to go to heaven. That's, that's real simple, right? And it's not like deep theology. We learned that at the very beginning. But we ought to draw from that. We ought to draw from that. We ought to have a confidence from that. So here's what we have. We have this, this promise from God in Paul's life. Okay? Now, this is a pretty cool circumstance. And, and you may look at it and go, man, I wish God would speak to me like he spoke to Paul. It would be really cool if I'm sitting in a prison cell and God with a, a voice or an impression or a dream or a vision paints this picture of what the rest of my life is going to look like. And it means I get out of the prison and I get to go preach the gospel. Or look at that and go, man, that's, that's pretty neat. But did you know that God has told you those promises that we have in Scripture? That's God's plan for your life. That's God's plan. He didn't reveal everything to Paul, did he? He said, hey, you're going to go to Rome. And you're going to preach the gospel just like in Jerusalem. He very much left out the part where he was going to lose his head in Rome. Didn't matter, did it? The, the privilege in there wasn't so much getting out of jail, but it was the privilege of being God's spokesman. He was going to get to go and take this gospel to Rome, and Paul was like, awesome, I've been wanting to do that forever. And same for us. Yes, the opportunity to serve God is the treasure. Though he may not have revealed everything to us, what it's going to look like in our lives as we grow and serve him, we may not know those things. We have these promises of God that should give us this type of confidence. All right? So we have this confidence of God. And so here's... In the midst of this confidence, you got this promise that God's going to get him out of jail. He's going to go take the gospel to Rome. And in the background, you have 40 criminals who have all decided, I am not going to eat, I am not going to drink, I am not going to do anything till Paul is dead. I will give my own life to kill him. You have 40 mercenaries that pop up and say, I'm killing Paul. So you have this, this tension right here at the beginning. God says, we'll set Paul free. And he's going to go tell the gospel in Rome. And then you have 40 mercenaries who say, I'm killing that guy before I eat another bite. Who do you think is going to win? I mean, it's just 40 on one, right? So, I mean, they should surely win. They don't know who they're messing with. God's promise versus man's plans. This is the backdrop of this whole story. You have God's promise, what he wants to see, and man's plans against God's promise. And what you're going to see over the next few weeks, you can't get to all of it today, what you'll see over the next few weeks is this. You're going to see God's promise explode from the pages of Acts. You're going to see him guard Paul. And I hope that it's encouragement to you that God always falls through, follows through on his promises. And we can have confidence in that. So, let's read a little bit, then we'll stop and we'll talk. 
Starting in verse 12, it says, When it was day, the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Uh, there were more than 40 who made this conspiracy. They went to the chief priests and elders and said, We have strictly bound ourselves by an oath to taste no food till we have killed Paul. So they enter into a covenant with the priest and say, We're going to kill this man before we take another bite or drink another drink. Now, to break a covenant with the priest was a death sentence. This was a big deal. A, a covenant with the priest in their minds was a covenant with God himself. So I think it's fairly ironic that they are they're making in their mind an oath to God's priest who's supposed to be speaking and communicating to God. And they promise God's intercessor that they're going to kill God's real intercessor. Uh, the messenger of God's real intercessor. Uh, they're going to kill Paul, one who walked and talked with Jesus. Okay, so we have this, this, this interesting, weird oath right here at the very beginning. They're not going to do any eating, any drinking, until they have killed this man. Now, if they break this, the custom of the day was that they would be killed. Verse 15, Now therefore you, along with the council, give notice to the tribune to bring him down to you, as though you were going to determine his case more exactly. And we are ready to kill him before he comes near. So here's what they do. They go to the priest, they go to the tribune, and they say, here's what we want you to do. We want you to call for Paul. And we want him here in Jerusalem, as, as he's coming from where he's being held, to Jerusalem, we're going to kill him. As he's being transported, we're going to take his life. This is our oath. This is our vow. All right? Verse 16, now the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush. So he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the tribune, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the tribune and said, Paul the prisoner called me and asked me to bring this young man to you as he has something to say to you. The tribune took him by the hand and going aside asked him privately, What is it that you have to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow, as though they were going to acquire something more closely about him. But do not be persuaded by them, for more than 40 of their men are lying in ambush for him, who have bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they have killed him, and now they are ready, waiting for your consent. So the tribune dismissed the young man, charging him, tell no one that you have informed me of these things. Okay, so here's the setting, or here's the plot for uh, for them trying to kill Paul. This would make, I think this would make for a great movie, a real deal. Because you have these 40 guys, you have all of these, these secrets that are being... <coughs> okay, all right. You have all of these secrets that are, that are happening uh, amongst these, these high-ranking officials, but these aren't the big dogs yet. We haven't got to them. All right? So all of this is taking place here in Jerusalem, and, and we have uh, Paul's sister's son finds out what this about this plot against him, and he runs on ahead, and, and he warns the people, hey, they're going to ask you to call for him. The Jews are going to pretend like they want to ask him some questions that have to do with his trial, but that's not the case. Don't fall for it. They just want him out of his protection so they can murder him. So that's the setting for this story, all right? You've got 40 people trying to kill Paul, but don't forget in verse 11, God says, we're going to deliver you. All right, so how does this happen? How is this going to play out? We know who wins in the end, hopefully, all right? So if we trust in God's promises, we know that Paul's going to be set free, but how does it all take place? Man, it's a beautiful story. Starting in verse 23. Then he called two of the centurions and said, Get ready 200 soldiers and 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go as far as Caesarea at the third hour of the night. Also provide mounts for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Felix the governor. And he wrote a letter to this effect. All right, and then the next few, uh, few thoughts are, are the letter that he wrote on ahead. So here's what this guy does. He said, you're going to try to kill someone in my territory? You're going to try to, to manipulate me into bringing this guy out so that you can murder him. I'll teach you. 
and he sends a whole daggum army. I mean, he sends horses and spears, and he sends everybody out there. And he says, you build a cage, you put Paul in the center of all of these people, and you take him, not to me, I don't want him anymore. People are trying to kill him. You take him to the big dog. You take him to Festus. So the governor of this whole area. So we're going to put this in our terms. Um, you would be taking him to the state, the state of Arkansas. All right. So instead of it being now, it's no longer a, an issue for the people of Magnolia because the people of Magnolia have risen up against him. Now you're taking him to the state of Arkansas. Ultimately, he's going to be meeting like with the president. All right. That's that's how this is all going to play out. He's going to meet with the king here in a few chapters. But this is on a big uh, this is on a big level at this point. He says, "All right. Well, we got this this group rising up." Let's send him on to this guy by the name of Fest or Felix. Yeah, we're with Felix right now. <coughs> All right, so he sends him on to Felix the governor. And he writes this letter, Claudius Lys uh, Lysias, to his excellence, the governor Felix. Greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them when I came upon them. And the soldiers rescued him. And he, he goes on. I won't read all of this for you. You know this story. Uh, he goes on and talks about what had happened. Uh, how he was in prison, how uh, he, he preached a message, all of those different things. He talks about everything that's led up to this point. Then he talks about this group that is trying to kill him. Um, and then he sends him on uh, to Felix. All right? Uh, then we pick up in chapter 24. Chapter 24. And after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one uh, Tertullus. So, so we've had... Five to six days pass. These guys have got to be getting hungry by now. Remember those guys? I mean, they've got to be pretty hungry. Hungry. All right? They're not eating. They're not drinking until he is dead. Remember that? If they break that oath, they're going to die. So at this point, maybe they've been faithful to it. Maybe they've cheated a little bit. Who knows? Remember, that's the kind of the backdrop of all of this. So there's an urgency in dealing with Paul. So they send some people on ahead, uh, Ananias, and came down with some elders and spokesmen, one turtle as they, they laid before uh, the governor their case against Paul. So now these Jews are bringing their case on this next level against Paul. And when he had been summoned, uh, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation. Doesn't this sound like a politician? I mean, they, they bring this spokesman into the group. This guy that's supposed to speak. And the first thing he does, he goes, you know what, Felix? You are super duper. We really like your rule and your reign. And in all reality, they hated this guy. They did not like him, but hey, they, they wanted to do something for him, so they're just going to... Uh, they're just going to give him all kinds of praises. So they're having this, this back and forth. This has got very much of a courtroom feel to me. Um, in every way, in every way, we accept this with all gratitude. But to detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. You know, hey, you're a busy man. We don't want to trouble you with a long dialogue or anything like that. You know, just, just listen to us a little bit. Just do us a little favor. For we have found this man a plague. One who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, we'll be able to find out from him about everything of which, he, of which we accuse him. The Jews also joined in the charge, affirming that all these things were so. When the governor had nodded to speak to him, Paul replied, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. Alright, so here we have all the accusations. And I mean, there's this group of guys that come in and they're like, Felix, you need to listen to us. Uh, and this guy is causing riots. He's trying to defame the temple by our uh, rules and regulations, by our standards. And this, this guy deserves to die, is basically the accusations that they are making. Just, just give him to us. Don't worry yourself about it. And then all you have is Felix looks over, and this is a powerful man, he looks over at Paul and he, he nods. Kind of like, okay, your turn. What do you have to say? And Paul begins. And he doesn't do exactly what they did. He didn't kind of 
uh, talk about Felix as great and wonderful. He says, hey, I cheerfully make my defense. You're in charge. Let me tell you what happened. Verse 11, you can, uh, you can verify that it is not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. And they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogue or in the city. Neither can they prove to you that they now bring up what they now bring up against me. But this I confess to you, that according to the word, which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets. So he, he starts like this. He said, um, as far as their accusations of the temple, hey, I was just there. And, and I wasn't doing any of the things that they mentioned. You know, I didn't have a big group of people. I wasn't teaching anything false. Remember, he had been warned that this was coming. And so and he, he was acting uh, he was acting really good when he was in Jerusalem during this time. All right, So he's innocent of all their charges. And now they're just making other stuff up. He says, you know, I can't even talk to that. Because they're just making stuff up as they go. Haven't done any of that stuff. Um, but then he says, I am a follower of the way. So he says, but I am a Christian. All right? But being a Christian, I affirm everything that the law says. So he, he begins to give his defense. So I always take pain to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. Now, after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult, but some Jews from Asia. They ought to be here before you. And to make an accusation, should they have anything against me? Or else let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council. So here's what he says. He said, so here's what I did. I came from my travels. Where I've been traveling around talking about Christianity, talking about the way. He said, I came to the temple. I came to give money. I didn't have a group of people around me. Matter of fact, the people who actually made the accusations against me, they've already gone back to Asia. Hey, where are they? I mean, the rules, customs of the day were the people who made the accusations were the ones that go against you. And he said, well, maybe there are other accusations. Let's ask these guys. What did you guys see me do? Well, they didn't see him do anything. They were going on the testimony of those other guys who were making things up as well. All right, so you're starting to see Paul's just destroying all of their, uh, all of their accusations against him. All right, so let's keep rolling through here. Uh, verse 19, they ought to be here, uh, verse 20, or else let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council. Other than this one thing that I cried out while standing among them, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. He says, there was the one thing that I said that might have made some of them mad. Remember when he was amongst the group and he had the Pharisees and the Sadducees? And he goes, hey, I'm, I'm of the resurrection of the dead. I believe in that. And then the Pharisees were all Team Paul then. Then they all got on there, and then there was this big argument between the two. So I did say that. Some of them probably didn't like that. But he concedes that point. This is by far not any reason to be killed. All right? So we get to verse 22. It says, But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off, saying, When uh, Lysias the tribune comes down, I will decide your case. So he listens to both parties, and he says, All right, we'll, we'll deal with this later. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody, but have some liberty, and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. So he's going to be protected, but he's going to have free reign, uh, probably, of the praetorium, the, the place where they were being. So he was going to be a mandatory guest of Felix for the next little while. Now, don't forget about those guys who promised that they were going to kill him in how long? Before they eat or drink? Before they ever take another drink? Now it's been several days. And the verdict that comes down from Felix is, you know what, let's just wait. And then when this other guy gets in town, you know, he's, he's kind of in charge of this, he makes these decisions, I'll talk with him, then we'll make our verdict. All right. After some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla. All right, so we've got his wife, Drusilla, and Felix, who was Jewish, and, and, and uh, he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. So, so now Felix and Drusilla and Paul, they're all kind of sitting down together, and they're having a great conversation. And they're having this conversation about what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ, 
Uh, one thing we know about Drusillo, she was the daughter of uh, King Agrippa, who we'll meet in a little bit. So Felix was the son-in-law. That's why he was probably the governor over this area, or it's why he got to marry Drusilla. Right? He was either the governor who got to marry her, or he was made governor by marrying her. All right, so you have a direct connection now to the king. And you've got these two sitting down and listening to Paul as he shares the gospel. Why? Because he's just walking around there uh, with them in the same place that they are staying freely, interacting with his friends. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. So here's this conversation that happens. And he begins to speak to him about repentance, righteousness, uh, second coming, all of these different principles of the gospel. He's speaking to them of Christ, and he sits down with this uh, governor and his wife, and he's sharing the gospel, and Felix is convicted. And he says, man, I don't hear any more of that. I'll, I'll let you know when I want to talk to you again. All right? So he sends him away. In verse 26, at the same time, he hoped that money would be given to him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. So we start to see, we start to see his sin nature. This Felix guy, this Felix character, who really hadn't done much in the story at this point, he starts meeting with Paul on a regular basis. Why? Because he hears, hey, this Paul guy, he might have some money. And if I meet with him and we kind of become friends, maybe he'll give me a large sum of money to let him go. But over and over and over, every time they meet, the only thing Paul offers is the gospel. And so they have this com these gospel conversations over and over. All right? Verse 27, when two years had elapsed, and this is, this is the last verse we're going to read. When two years had elapsed. Now let's pause. Those guys are super hungry. Right? I don't think it was an accident that this was put in here. Okay, there's, there's a reason why we have all of these days, these five days, and then a couple days, and then, hey, when this guy comes, and they go ahead and meet with you, and then they meet several times. So there's this, kind of this time frame that we're seeing explode in this passage, and it ends in, at the end of chapter 24 with this statement, and after two years, the idea was those guys were either liars and they had probably run off somewhere because they could no longer be uh, in any connection or around the priest because they had made an oath that they had broken. Or they were faithful to their oath and they was dead. Those are the only two options. These guys were either dead or traitors. So at the beginning of the story, you have the tension. Here's the tension. God says, Paul, I've got a plan for you. I'm going to set you free from here. And then you have these 40 men who say, I don't care what God's plan is. I'm going to kill you. And I'm not going to eat. And I'm not going to drink until it happens. And two years later, Paul and God are victorious. And those guys are either traitors, chickens running for their life, or they are dead. And that's a big, long story. And there's a lot of principles you can grab from that story. You see Paul's confidence, and you can talk about his faith, and you can talk about uh, God's providence there in his life, but I think you see this tension end when you realize Paul's still alive two years later, and the guys that swore to kill him were either dead or traitors. Those are the only two options. They had made a blood oath with the priest. They weren't going to be allowed to be in the temple. They weren't going to be connected to uh, what they perceived as God anymore. So we see this contrast. And I want you guys to have a, a confidence in this, okay? God